No, no, you say. No, 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 no. Maybe, maybe it's better like this. Yes. And you scroll. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Have only few. Uh, well, maybe we can put this on later. Huh? Not yet. Just keep it blank. Okay. Just have these slides distract. Okay. Okay. So how do I do that? Uh, Stop sharing. I'll ask you to put the button. Very good. So, well, thank you very much. That was a very exciting session we've just now had. Now, Matteo will ask me to speak today, it's briefly, on uh, the ramifications of the uh, ideas that I've tried to explore as a snapshot in time to uh, the impact inequality, because sort of I want you to argue that that's a entry into a sustainability analysis. If sustainable development or any variation on that thought have to have any meaning, it is to have any meaning, it must, as a minimum, um, cope with the, the possibility that nature is not continually tampered with to the extent that it degrades. So I focused attention on that. And I focused attention on that in particular because the error is so large now. The overshoot is so large now that all else, in some sense, for the moment should be kept aside. That's the biggest threat to, uh, to the human community. Now, what I want to do today is, given all the discussions we have had, I've really changed my plans of this course. I thought what I'd like to do is discuss some methodological issues, because I think that lies at the heart of some misunderstanding I detected amongst non-economists, particularly about what has driven economics in a direction which, of course, I fully believe has been wrong. But the issue is not, in my judgment, is it wrong because economists are stupid? Or is it because the data that they observe at the time of experiences, at the time of the development of, say, growth theory, growth models, were such that they moved in a particular direction in approximating the world at large. All models are totally unrealistic, what's that saying? That's what we call the model, they're caricature of the world. The question is, you know, is the caricature doing justice to what it is you see? Um, and the, my own feeling is that research is almost invariably incremental and suffers from hysteresis of the reason that we Graduate students follow their teacher, and by the time they become a teacher, they've already got a human capital captured in a particular way of thinking. So it's marginal changes that take place. Um, so we should not be surprised if the defect persists until a shock. General concern about the in ineffectiveness of the models make people change. So the way I've approached the, my work and in particular the review, is to bend backwards and try and understand what are the implicit assumptions in the growth models that have, de uh, that have been devised since, I, let's just for the sake of argument, we got Robert Solow's 1956 growth model as the paradigm from which uh, paradigmatic uh, uh, expression of macroeconomic growth of the long run, uh, which has influenced growth theory. Now, Growth theory is not just theory. Believe me, it affects, it influenced governments for the last 40 years, 50 years, government policy. Every department, treasury department, uh, central bank, uh, different departments of planning in, in Latin America, Asia, and so forth, uh, will follow some variation there. We start with very aggregate models, and of course, the different departments will disaggregate it to suit their purpose. So the infrastructure department will have a more disaggregate model of investment in various categories and so forth. But the aim throughout is to amalgamate and to make it into coherent whole for policy making, particularly when ministers buy for central budget for their purposes. All models, if they are any good, we'll have some assumptions that can be uh, criticized because they're explicit. The point, that's the easy bit. 
uh, identifying the explicit assumptions and then saying, well, this is unrealistic, or this is the cause of our problems, you know, you know why the policies are unsustainable. It's the implicit ones which are hard, the hidden ones. And what I'm trying to do, what I want to do with you today is to go through, in my judgment, that turns out to be, in some sense, the key implicit assumption which has led to a rather re resistance to the kinds of complaints that ecologists or environmental scientists or friends of mine, particularly in the, in the older days, of, um, in the 1960s, 70s, friends of mine like uh, Paul Ehrlich and others have been They were not taken seriously by economists and the question is why? Why didn't the limits to growth, which have been referred to so many times in this conference here, why didn't that have any effect on the, if you like, the decision makers? Never mind the public at large. Uh, what was wrong with the uh, world models of geoforest and others? So I'm going to take the, I'm going to look at the perspective from the economist vantage point. I'm going to put myself in the position of somebody who has been trashing the old world models, if you like, and then see where he or she comes from. And then I want to show you how to uh, stay close to the orthodoxy in modeling. I don't mean politics, I mean modeling. And then see how best, quickest way of moving away uh, from the errors of the models that I see. Now we use expressions like circular economy uh, as metaphors, and that's fine. But don't believe me, no economist will deny that they're in the circular economy. Problem isn't that. But the key will be, uh, well, the circle can expand. It's a circular economy, yes, but you can keep on expanding, and that's called growth. So one has to contend with that. The hidden idea here is that technological progress, responding to incentives, uh, perhaps market signals, in the 70s certainly, uh, when the world uh, models were published, they were criticized heavily for the fact that they had no prices in them. So there was no obvious signal uh, which would enable people to respond to resource scarcities. No economist would think it was a uh, revelation that if you have an exhaustible resource, then it will be exhausted in time if you just extract it. By definition, it's a finite resource. You don't need expanding population by the way. All you need to do is to keep on using it and eventually it will go to zero. So if the world depends on it, crucially, if it's an essential commodity, then you have sunk anyway. There's nothing very much to do. So the economists would, uh, would argue, well, if it's exhaustible, and that was the kind of criticism that Nordhaus and others made of the world models, a very well-known paper in the economic journal, was that, well, if this is exhaustible, then could there be price response, the price will rise. People will try and find substitutes. And so the idea of substitutability became absolutely paramount to go through. And I personally was uh, involved in it, and I'll come to it uh, just as a, an aside as I, come along, as, as I go along. So that's where we come to. That is, the idea is not that there, it's a finite world. The idea is that human ingenuity and appropriate investment in different types of capital assets which can substitute for the growing scarcity of those which we are being, uh, are being uh, depleted will enable us to continue growing, uh, not forever. Forever was never in the idea. It was it's better for a long while, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years. Now, of course, the evidence speaks against it. We know now that. We know that now. But we are now talking about the attitude of the growth modelers of the 1970s when the world models were being uh, described. Now, when I came to it, this was 1972 or 73, I think, when the world, when I read the, had a look at the world, the black fighter agreed with Nordhaus that there were no prices. And we ought to think in terms of uh, something like prices uh, to serve as signals for individual response to scare, growing scarcities. I felt also, of course, 
that the growth models didn't have any resources in them. So in a way, I was sitting in the middle of being a target for both sides. The question is, how do you introduce these resources? Now, the resources that I studied in the 1970s were built on the then concern, exhaustible resources. It may have had to do something with the price rise, you know, in 1973, the OPEC price rise, but that had nothing to do with scarcity. It had to do with a lot of polygopony power. Coalition of oil producers raised the price, but it was, it was, the reaction was interpreted, it was interpreted as though, what do we do with the price rises? Um, later in my work, I realized that exhaustible resources were not quite the uh, point of issue, and uh, I was alluding to it in my lecture on Monday, uh, because in some sense, the weakness of climate economics, as I see it, has been that it's been too easy. It's regarded conventional model of economics, the ones that are criticizing physically, do like the solo at that models, and there have been variations on that, and I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but you just embed on it, graft onto it, the climate system. And then if you, of course, if you're lucky, you're moving through the technological progress picture that you move from fossil fuels to clean energy. And if you can do that, and the models were telling you 2% investment will do the trick for you, well, 2% investment is nothing. If you invest 15% of your GDP, 2% on this, you still got 13% to build roads and buildings and so forth and so on. And so growth can continue. That is a picture that should be resisted for reasons that I mentioned on Monday, and which is no news to any of you here, but I'm looking at it from the economic model point of view. Um, so what I tried to do in my review in some star chapters, um, which I have circulated by the way, so I'm not going to go through in a boring way, equation after equation, because that's not the interesting thing. I just want to show you something uh, which suggests to me that it's possible to integrate uh, economic modeling, modeling the global economy. I'm going to look only at the global thing. So I don't think, let's say I'm thinking in terms of the World Bank's coverage, the World Bank thinks in terms of global economic models and so forth. Let's do it here. I want to build in ecology in it and demography. And I think I want to emphasize the demographic side, which Need, does not need to be emphasized here because you've taken demography very seriously at this conference, but it's a very rare phenomenon. Ecologists don't typically study the human uh, numbers and economists don't. And of course, today it's not politically correct to talk about population. So there is a problem there as well. Um, so I'm gonna to stick to, I want to stay clean, clean with orthodoxy. Uh, to, to show you how to model it. Can I have the first? Uh, so to show what departures I'm making to modeling it, to give you a picture of sustainability, which will pick up many of the points that have been raised over, over the past two days. So I'm now looking at a moment in time, t, small t, and, and this equation one is just a plural production function. Uh... It says output y is a function of Ignore the first two terms here. K, produced capital, H, human capital, and R, uh, extracted resources. Okay. Uh, we, uh, these are R. So you can, those of you who are familiar with this production model, this is as kosher as it can be. It's constant in terms of scale. But these coefficients add up to one. This, this bit, if you ignore that, is solar. What I'm covering up is solar. And since then, of course, as those of you who are approximate, this is a side remark for the economists, have been adding a technology term, productivity term. And as I was suggesting in my, uh, in the uh, 1970s work, and 80s work on exhaustible and renewable resources are was a flow of resources taken from nature. 
good space for lecture and good introduction. Okay. Um, now, one thing I've met in the trick in economics has been always to argue that even if this goes to zero in the long run, this, provided it is allowed to expand sufficiently in commerce. That's the idea behind technological progress as a route to our sustainable development. Sustainable development is sustainable even if Mother Nature is not sustainable. You want to argue against that. No, the distinction I was drawing, and it's not my distinction, it's ecologist distinction in the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And I think to me, it's really not sure that they drew quite as much meat out of that distinction as I'd like to think I have been able to do. But the idea is there is to distinguish between provisional goods and uh, maintenance and regulating services. And what I've done here is to add the fact of all the S, call it the stock of natural account. That's the biosphere for like the global economy. Okay. Uh, of course, all of this can be disaggregated. That's for sure. And that, but that's not going to help us much. We want to look at the conceptual side and stay as close as possible to orthodox modeling to see how to break out of it to give us the passive access that we want. So this is almost as a product term. So this is the standard production function that I'm married to, not just the productivity as seen as technological change, but the stock itself. So it's like a blanket in which the human economy is shut, is enclosed. And if this starts defining for a variety of reasons, for the reasons I won't be doing behavioral economics here at all, by the way. I'm just going to be looking at stocks and quotes equations. That's, that's the first cut into more. If this stuff, then if you keep on expanding this and this to the cows come home, if this goes on declining sufficiently fast, you're in trouble. Okay. So we've got two, big, two aspects of nature coming in. If you, this will be the provisioning goods, and that as a stock is the uh, as the uh, regulating and maintenance services. And this is a flow. So that's a stock, that's a stock, that's a flow converted into a flow output. But that flow is being affected by the stock of knowledge, if you like, in institutions, and the stock of the biosphere as its source of the regulating and maintenance services. Now, a few things, just a few side, one remark, this remark is useful because I think it was, we were discussing it the other day. It's extremely interesting, these things, they have incredible power in our lives, on our lives, because they infiltrate government thinking. So if you ignore this, as aggregate models in the World Bank, for example, that do, then if you try and estimate total factor productivity, which is a notion that you come across, the idea is total factor productivity. But think of all the inputs in, the, in, in our output as an aggregate input. So it's this whole thing of an aggregate. Then what's the productivity of that input in production? And that's seen in this A. You're ignoring this because it doesn't exist. So it's one, let's call it one, it stays put. Well, then it turns out, and it's very easy to show that estimates of productivity growth will be higher. The more you do damage Mother Earth, because you're not counting that, you're not observing it, it's not on your measurement. So, if somebody says that productivity growth has been very high in the UK economy, it hasn't been, never mind, <laughs> or in the Chinese economy, it's very high, don't be fooled, because it could be that she's been mining nature like crazy, but it looks up in the national statistics of high productivity. That's very easy to see. Uh, and I have the second one. So that's the background. Now, what I want to do is I want to add two seconds to it. Oh. Well, just so I understand something. Yeah. It's not so important that we actually believe that you could be proposed for a big product, but it's a function of those things. Sorry? It's not that sorry, it's not that we should take product seriously. But rather, we understand that it's a function. Oh, yes, 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 yes. The product particular function is all this. The, the functional yeah. form is just to keep the orthodox. Absolutely. Yes. 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 But it's important, though, because it has substitutability built into it. 
Right. right. It's important they're both necessary yes. in our yeah, yeah. 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 So the product does. Okay. Now please leave colour in for the purposes of this description. The simple the stock is the test that I've already mentioned. The rate of change of that is the right hand side. And of course, this, if it's negative, is what the impact inequality was. So here is the net regenerative rate of the biosphere in terms of regulating and maintenance. This is what we obtain now in the biosphere. And this is the crucial input, which is a key thing which we, we economists have not taken on board, but of course, economists have been banging on about it. Is that because it's a circular economy, the waste, what happens to the waste? It has to be degraded. And the limits of degradation is going to be key to my, my way of trying to explain why indefinite growth is not possible. So, why change my GDP, if you like? That's the index I was using. And that's my alpha, which I explained as the efficiency parameter, which it, uh, it uh, draws on Mother Nature's. Regulating service. So if this RT plus a T, this sum of this RT and YT, if that exceeds G, then DSDT was negative. And that's what I wrote down as a snapshot in the impact of equality. So you, the, the idea is to give it uh, dynamics. And the key idea that I've taken from uh, the ecologist's writing. To the extent that I understand it, is that alpha is imagine that that's endogenous, it's going to be dependent on knowledge and technology. So let's make it into that. And we say that alpha is maybe an increasing function of A, but the question is, is it done? The key is going to be over alpha. And if you think it's bound, if you think it's unbounded, because A can do the trick for you to raise alpha to infinity. Then of course you have it, you can get away with indefinite growth because this could go on increasing. If this goes on increasing fast enough, this would be kept finite and you're in business. Okay. So the hidden assumption that I want to point out is the following. All the models in growth economics and in the, the notes that I've sent circulated before with to you, you'll find them. I've listed them too. Starting from solo to endogenous growth models, so right through to show that there is a common assumption in all of them, and that's the hidden one, which is the following No matter how large the economy is in terms of GDP, at the margin, the demand you will be making for an additional, uh, the demand you'll make from Mother Nature for an additional amount of output will be vanishingly small. It will go to zero in the limit. Because if it, and that's equivalent to saying that alpha has no bound. So the boundedness of alpha, which comes from the fact that it is not possible to get an infinite amount or an indefinitely large output from a vanishing amount in other nature. Is the one which keeps the gap in policy. And that, of course, seals the loop, that seals that idea that you can have why increasing definitely. Because if why keeps on increasing, this is a bit negative and negative, and then eventually gets to zero. zero. And then back to the feedback with the, with the uh, output production function of equation one, your output increases. So the idea that you can't you, uh, even though GDP does not take depreciation into account. GDP, it's just output goes out, doesn't be that you can keep on indefinitely doing this because at the end of the day, you lose. So that's Sorry. the uh, Pat, yeah. So yeah. for G, you mean a decreasing function of S? So is oh, well, this... can we have the next slide? Oh, okay. Just give you an example. I can't possibly not try that in long in here. <laughs> Not in this crowd. So here's the example I work with. If you ignore this, bit, this must be familiar to you all. The square back, if you ignore that bit, you've got this simple logistic function. That's standard. 
what all I've done is to multiply it by that factor um, so that my, my, uh, my logical equation is that this entire thing so I replace G by that. And I just if you have a look at the next slide, you'll see what this is. Well, that's your nonlinearity. I mean, otherwise, I'm not even going to say if you come to uh, ICGP and that we only produce one K function. <laughs> so here is the here is the S a uh, G function. L is the critical that the system collapses. Um, if you're on this side, G the stop to the right of it, you can you can have sustainable, if you could be sustainable if the R that you're taking out exceeds uh, the output, then of course your S will be shrinking. Uh, and then uh, this is unstable, you know, this is, these are stable, and then it doesn't shrink. And so you're in trouble. So if you can come back to it. No, I'll make it up. So that's that's the driver. Mm -hmm. And I want to have one final equation, one more equation. That's I'm down. Sorry. No. So, uh, yes. I wanted to give the demographic equation to be uh, no. Yeah. Yes. Here we are. So that will close the model. Standard models of economics either have population, human population very definite at a constant rate as it's all released and others, or in my kind of world of what's that model. Or a constant, but that's of course uh, some long run constants that are proven. We are now talking about a world in which you can not be able to do that. So here's the dynamics of the uh, global population. N uh, is, is my and remember the production function had H in it. Remember, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm moving very slowly. But can I have the previous slide? Um, Yeah, uh, the next one. I'm sorry, very sorry. I should have. Oh. The first one? Uh, no, next one. I'm so sorry. Mm. Yes. So oh, okay. the function, I had human tap. And here I'm talking about human tap with the capital multiplied by the population. So that's the link to the next equation. So now we move to population. Once I've got my age, small age, I can talk exactly so, so, mm -hmm. so here's the population numbers. And I'm taking a logistic form for that. And here's a lot of observation that uh, these parameters, new mu is like a target, but mu j is like a target population of the I'm supposing for the same, just imagine for the same uh, sake of argument, it's simplicity, just as a process of observation. Imagine that there is a representative household. I'll, I'll go against it in a minute and show you how these models can be generalized in the directions you want. Suppose it is a representative household. In this equation, it's saying that the size of the household, there's a target, mu times j. And the j is a function of small h, which is such as what? More human capital. You, uh, uh, okay. So, the equilibrium will be where n is equal to mu times j. Now you then say, of course, representative household models are bad. We just, sorry, why, uh, why do you say uh, sorry, why sorry. dj dh is negative? Because uh, yes, the more uh, uh, you have educated people, the less so, uh, they do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, what happens in the way to uh, break the parts of uh, identical households is to say that my mu is a parameter which would reflect the extent to which there are externalities across households. Say, for example, of the kind that uh, you were studying earlier this morning, which is suppose households mimic one another. So your mu would be affected by the institutional structure. <clears throat> um, all right, so that's that basically the start of the story. And you play now you have three dynamical equations. What you now need is accumulation equations. That is to say, what I've got here are simply stocks and flows. But I wanted to do that to show how to move away from conventional economic reason modeling with the minimal amount of manipulation tools and see 
with what is going to tell you regarding sustainability. It's telling us that even if you have pure orthodoxy in the production function, as I think the patient now, he will, with the nonlinearity that it's got, and of course, there'll be different types of stocks. You can disaggregate and say, instead of capital S, there'll be S1 type stock, different types of grasslands, oceans, and so forth. But those are details for which this is not equipped to deal with for the reason that it doesn't make sense to do that. But here we have the situation where you can actually get a story of sustainability in a manner in which I was doing on Monday without any dynamics. Now, so what will happen is, let me show you the next one. I think I, left, I, think I wrote down the accumulation investment. Okay. Your total I output is broken up into consumption and investment, but the investment now is in three categories produced capital, human capital, and knowledge and institutions. Okay. And so, now can I have the next one? So that's a stock equation, and these are flow equations. So the net investment in produced capital, that's the left hand side, net investment, is gross investment <coughs> minus depreciation, built by the sector. That's standard, absolutely standard. This one therefore says that the KDT, that is to say net investment in produced capital, which is the one which our government offices. Right, and others are constantly looking at is this panel. That's just pure subject. This one is the interesting and an interesting one, and Godinus models are talking about it, which is the AT, the rate, rate of change of knowledge, is a function of investment or the equal to investment. Okay. Now, of course, if you want to go into my trade knowledge, then you will be talking about institutions which are going to deliver this capital power. There's a huge literature on that. Firms invest, they compete against one another for product, and then so forth. There's a whole game to it, economic game to it in literature. I'm not going to go into that, but see what's going on. At the aggregate level, it's just, these are the aggregate flows and stops telling us where the hidden assumptions are. So that's the next. And this one is easy. Sorry, but. Yeah. So, uh, how do we think about depreciation of capital? Isn't this. Uh, Affecting uh, Mother Nature in some sense, or is it, it affecting us? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, is this uh, like. Uh, sure, because this depreciation is being picked up, remember, in the uh, what, white team divided by alpha. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. White okay. is in white team divided by alpha, which is in the right hand side, minus white team divided by alpha. Yes. That was affecting. So oh, okay. And that depreciation is already been picked up. But other okay. it's been picked up in other ways too. Okay. And this is the well, this is kind of this also. Uh, yeah. and of course, here for here you would put in the uh, the nonlinear quadratic function. So this is giving us our national income accounts as seen by the national account. The economist who wants to understand the data will have to provide a micro foundation on why investment here is what it is, why consumption is what it is, and the various different forms of investment, and the distortions in the market, absence of prices, and so forth, which are affecting the country. And most of my review was concerned with the microeconomics, show that the absence of markets, I come back to. The original objection to the limits to growth and uh, well models by economists. The absence of markets suggests that the economists were wrong to think that not having prices was the worst mistake you can make. And equally, that mistake would be not to have mother nature. The two together are bad, are very explosive for us. Okay. Um, I think I'll stop there because that pretty much gives you a sense of what is happening. Now, I don't have a, 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 the notes that I've given you have a whole section in which I looked at models of Stiglitz, uh, my own with Eel, 
solo, my leads, and the more endogenous models to show how the parameters, they are special cases like the general model that have a equation. Okay, but this, they all have one hidden assumption, they never explicit, which is that why keeps on going increasing at the margin, mother nature, the demand that mother will be made of mother nature is go to zero and go to zero through expansion of A. That's knowledge with baby at all. That's right. Okay. Uh, um, yes, okay. uh, just to, to make sure I'm understanding DA, DT yeah. is increasing knowledge as a function of the investment in knowledge yeah. in education or an institution. Um, is it that assuming that there are no other kinds of knowledge? Because if you do not invest in education, you will also have knowledge that might not be the one that you want to foster. Very good point. And it could be what happens in in, in very poor areas in developing countries like a slum is that the kind of knowledge that is generated there is, is driven by a different kind of investment. Yes, which is the investment in drugs, the investment in in all this sort of knowledge, which is not the one we want to also. Yes. So how do you could you put some or not, I make a little bit more problem? Maybe that is a very good knowledge that is lost. Yes. Very good point. So you you've already shown how to expand this equation. It's not a problem. Because if there is a constant, you see, mm -hmm. I was including in this I the investment that parents make to community makes in the child's that's not exactly time. Time it, it involves time and effort. So that you mustn't think that this these stock flows are all built on companies, government. So, so I'm including that. Now that type of knowledge, you can include that, of course, in the microeconomics as well. Yeah, because that will generate if you don't invest, yeah, the other thing will take over. Yes, indeed, and we go to hell. Yes. I mean, there's just a lot that you can do with this. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Forget my question is a bit stuck, a bit Cassiel, but I was um, wondering about the boundedness of what you uh, constitute Mother Nature because that's changed over time, right? Where if we look back historically, we have people, societies who are extracting a lot from their local landscape, and then the landscape got larger. And so my, I guess my main question is, with this global boundedness, is that potentially taking into account the fact that that boundedness could change too? Yes. Thank you very much for asking. Look, this is an aggregate growth model, okay? Because I wanted to stick as close as possible to the models that are used at the bank, governments, and so forth for international purposes. Um, but this entire fabric of thought can be taken to a community. So that the very you have X would be the ecosystem. Okay, so by review, we can find the middle chapter. So much involved uh, discussing the interaction of poverty and the natural resource space and the kind of social norms where the law is not operative. If nothing else, because the distance is so large that you can't take it, you know, the courts are 100 miles away, so you know, lawyers and so forth. Uh, and long before formal law, norms of behavior which guided societies. Now, there is a lot of rich literature, as you well know, uh, on that from anthropologists, and I've tried to uh, bring them together into an analytical form in chapter six of my book. It's called Laws and Norms as Social Institutions. So you can see where I'm heading. There, you would be giving a picture of the investment that takes place in Mother Nature, protection, essentially. To ensure that, or try and ensure that ESDT is not negative. So that the, my thought here is that essentially this is a story of asset management, and if anything that is slightly novel in the review is to argue that we are all asset managers, and it was the first thing that was picked up as a point against the review by uh, well. 
distinguished uh, journalists saying that this review is commodified nature. Christ. The first, the poorer the people are, the more they commodify. I can assure you, I know enough about the farmer, the, the fisherman, but you know, their lives depend on that, their assets. And they're solving arbitrary equations without knowing that they're doing that. Well, they are doing it. They're adjusting the rates of which they, you know, that particularly well, I'm sure. And so, yes, this can be this kind of model, obviously adapted to the local environment, is what is exactly. uh, Whether it's a coastal village, or it's a community in the grasslands, mm -hmm. uh, of course, the capital net will have goes without saying. Different types of network, and then the other types of network will give us what we need. And what the eyes are. So, I don't know. Alas, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. First of all, first of all, I'm very, very happy to see you know a population dynamics built into the economic uh, model, although in a simplified form. So we show that already this workshop has already created some <laughs> some some interdisciplinary stuff. Uh, let's assume now that uh, Matteo is the government that has been thinking for 40 years in terms of macroeconomic. And now, with, in the language that Matteo government understands, you are presented these fabrics, these narratives. Then Matteo would ask, okay, and then what should I, what do you expect me to do? Well, one of the things I would expect to do, the first, first point of call would be, depending on which, uh, uh, sorry, uh, department you would have, if it's the Office of National Statistics, I'll tend to tell them to start compiling data with a view to capturing these ideas, particularly these wealth, which I, I have not gone into today because I went into it last time. Inclusive wealth simply would be the, the accounting value of K, uh, H, and an N. And N, sorry, an S. That's it. That's human capital, natural capital, and so on. So that would be good. How do you have to pay those economic values? Well, you start with market prices, but there's tons of work which you can try and tease out the market prices if the market prices are way off or they're zero. Like, like the accounting price for, let's say, the atmosphere as a sink for our carbon. That's what's called the social cost of carbon. There have been attempts of trying to estimate that. Hey, hey, $100, $100 a pound. And so that's the idea. And if it was policy, the first So that's the, the first point of that. Policy departments, if the data are telling you that actually ESBT is negative, or something, you know, then how do we reduce the pressure? And we look at these equations, I mean, that's an easy equation, I don't need this particular equation. But the idea would be to see where the distortions are and where you need the policy to. I tried to discuss that on Monday, but I was doing that by looking at each of the components, capital N, small y, alpha. And here, of course, I'm giving the dynamics of those, capital N, small y. Because small y is simply capital Y divided by capital N. So the policies would be typically would be fiscal policies as a start. So if there are Missing markets as a types of natural capital. We need to help them remove subsidies for itself, like agricultural subsidies, because they're creating huge market crash. And there's you know, and they're, so they're, they're, they're regarding nature as negative price, not just zero price. You pay yourself to exploit nature. That's, that's these uh, agricultural subsidies that they need to have. Now, if you remove those, we're looking at about five to six trillion dollars a year of subsidy, but these are invoicing ESP. Now that's a hell of a lot to do for pressure. The problem is I was suggesting on Monday, looking at from the blink that I as economists, is that we're treating Mother Nature as a free good, or much of Mother Nature as a free good, or negative price of it. So the first port of call is to take that process seriously and convince that this is a major part of the exercise of the trade. Finance ministers, the banks, then you would try and get some some price through the distortion. 
one class. The other class of things will be, of course, institutional changes. For example, try and borrow, in my judgment, it would be a great deal to be kind from the West learning from poor countries as to how traditional societies manage their work with the people systems. You can't quite do that with the global ecosystem, it'd be too large a population. But there are many things you can do at the community level which have been solved in Latin America, Africa, India. And they have been solved, but have been unsolved through government intrusions. There are lovely case studies, very sad case studies uh, of post-colonial communities, where governments in Africa felt they had to establish their authority. So they intervened in the lives of rural communities, telling them they can't do this or they can't do that regarding say what control the managing the forest. There are tons of wonderful technological work on that. And of course, that destroyed the, we use the word local culture. What I mean is, what I would say is, they destroyed the social norms of the people. The prohibitions of doing this and that, the prohibitions of taking things at the wrong time of the year, because it's a common part of time for the, for the local ecosystem. So you don't have very easy to walk. Now, that may be qualified through saying that it's sacred or the gods will be annoyed or whatever, but the fact is that they seem to have worked in the past. When they get destroyed, but are not replaced by them, they could substitute institutions. Then we have problems. And we have problems largely because, in this case, the cases that I'm thinking of now in response to the question that you're asking is that uh, the knowledge that local communities have of the local ecosystem far exceed the knowledge of the range who comes trained of the local ecosystem, the local ecosystem, the eccentricities, the idiosyncrasies of, of small scale things. So there, these are things that really governments have to uh, should think about. And so that really redirects here. I mean, I have had many discussions of this kind with my friends, my old friends in India, who are now who have been major players in government. And to them, this smacks of sort of, it may be sort of a kind of a post-colonial reaction. This acts of sort of going back to something they don't want to think about. Um, I find that quite odd because I'm a pretty modern person myself. It's just that, you know, um, we've improved in so many ways, but we've also deteriorated in many ways. Anyway. I had a bit of a question. So this is really illuminating thinking about our conversation also the other day. Um, I, but just also connecting to, to the previous talk, this will have different regimes of solutions, right? As you sort of pointed out as you went, as you, some regimes will crash, some regimes may be sustainable if they have the right parameters. I, I don't have the notes, so I don't know how far you went investigating this. A lot of these models, then they have relatively simple balance of paths when everything's linear. Again, you got exponentials maybe. But then they can also get very sensitive away from that, right? Where they blow up or they have regimes that go too fast. Uh, I seems like we have not you have uh, analyzed, analyzed these done. I see. So that's part of the question. I have not done that. So I've literally done this. In the ones that the, the notes I circulated, I still circulated two sets of notes, by the way. The first is what I've just now done, uh, and I've ignored the uh, discussion of the existing imperatives. <coughs> And the second one is an optimization. So I've written down the first of you know, the uh, Montreal conditions. By the way, the, the socialist economy. Who did uh, receive this two lecture notes? These two notes? Yes. Yeah. Ah, they are on the shelf. Oh, okay. Then I, have not, I have not studied the data. Right. Largely because I don't know how much, you know. Right. I didn't right. feel that was worth it doing. Well, yeah. oh, there's the alpha and the A, yeah, exactly. And exactly. The exactly. Of a, exactly. Will be sensitive. Exactly. Okay. But it, this is it. It's a benchmark framework. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. That's, that's good. Great. So we, let's say we have two because we have um, online talks. So between here, but they will uh, here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, I, should just, I should say one thing. There is, uh, sorry, can I just oh, please, in, 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 in relative policy? One policy I am rather obsessed with it, I personally, largely because nobody else thinks about it, I'll repeat about here, 
is population. Yeah, that's what, that's yeah. what that's and uh, yeah. I know we can uh, So Aisha's lecture uh, yesterday suggested how much could be achieved if African countries, yeah. in the yeah. for example, uh, yes. tried to reason with the leaders of the community that the idea that yeah. women have you know, to be empowered is not a Western uh, colonial. Uh, but there's a lot that can be done on N. And remember the N function that I have, have the mu and the J. So the target, so I need to play with those parameters, modeling the system, which keeps mu times J very hard. So the target population that the equation is giving would be six, seven children per woman, as opposed to. So the equation is, is not very simplified. It's actually quite a rich equation. I'm going to just probably add a quote uh, for the foundation <coughs> because the parameters are telling you uh, what the target is, the household target. Now, how do I know that the household actually has target? There's a lot of literature on that. One very interesting example was from the 1971 uh, famine that Bangladesh suffered from the cycle uh, that resulted in about a million additional deaths of children. They were replaced within a year. That's extraordinary. <laughs> was consistent with uh, I was finding that fecundity is not that sensitive to nutritional state. We might think that obviously, but you would need huge stress because it's you know, yeah. it's looks like that. So population Dynamics is key there. And yeah. the and the dynamics involved the mean and the J function. Which also something to do with how human capital plays in access to access, access to So that's probably a point to be taken for the program of Buddhism. That's exactly it. Sorry, thank you very much, Father. <laughs>